are and then let it flow. Yeah. Okay, my name is John Podmajerski and I'm 78 years old and I was born and raised here in Pilsen and I spent most of my life outside of the school and the army in this community. And uh, I, uh, I was like, being 78, I went through a lot of changes. Like when I got, when I, at, I grew up in the 20s and uh, it was just a very delightful neighborhood. You know, my folks were in the milk business so I had a lot of uh, contact with people as a child. And then when I got a little older, I was uh, I was working like a man at 10 to 12, already driving a horse and wagon. And uh, I'd learned to drive a truck at 12. And uh, given that my father was like a self-taught person, I learned uh, just about being intu intuitive. I learned, you know, all of a sudden I see something and I could recreate it. And I don't even realize the gift it was at the time because it kind of somehow disappeared now. But uh, one of the things I liked about the neighborhood, it's how uh, friendly, how uh, safe it was. And given it was like about 70% Slovak and about 20% Lithuanian, and then it was about 10% of the residual Irish and German that lived here before the Slovak. And you know, Pilsen's always been a, like a port of entry. When people come here, it's the first place with the lowest cost housing and where you, they're like ethnic. Anyway, in the Slovak area, that was like a port of entry. And uh, I grew up, uh, my father eventually got into this milk business when I was like 10, 12 years old. And then I uh, grew up in that environment where my father uh, brought in a bunch of friends from Europe, cousins and uncles, to work. And uh, then I, we had a, our whole extended family, and one of the things I really remember is about holidays like Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, all the ho holidays that we have here, they were like in Slovakia. And I just enjoyed the, the richness of the culture, you know, the costumes and the, the kind of food, and everybody was like really in a great place as far as being a family and community. Then I grew up with this, uh, a lot of cousins. I had 13 uh, relatives, cousins. And I grew up with them. We were like an extended family. And it was just great uh, that I could just go out like a snowfall. We'd big, build a big uh, snow hut. We all got on the, together and built a big like six or seven foot high. And uh, it was really joy. <laughs> and uh, anyway, my childhood was like that. And uh, I, as, I, as I went to school, I went to school here. I went to Jefferson School. It, it closed down when I was in fourth grade. It was on Jeffer 17 Jefferson. Then I went to another school called Walsh. It was on uh, 19th and Peoria, on 20th and Peoria. And there was another group of people there. And uh, the thing I, uh, I liked about the area, you know, I got to mix with all kinds of, like this was a very ethnic, you know, we had the Slovaks and the uh, Lithuanians, the Irish, the Germans, the Italians, the blacks. Uh, it was just like racially, you know, I grew up into a very racial environment. Somehow we all got to, we all like worked it out as kids. You know, we played ball, you know, basketball, baseball. And it was like, great, I could walk anywhere and people knew me. I got to be a pretty good baseball player because I was working like, working and I had strong arms, I could hit the ball a mile. So I became a little popular in the area. We had like tournaments. And I said these 11 churches all provided great opportunities for kids. When I was a child, it was considered like they're out here to rehab or to support these young people, you know, of low economic social standard. And they all had great programs. I mean, the, like I said, Mennonites had these uh, big dinners and they had to go to farm for a week and they had all kinds of other activities. And the, Methodists had where you could go swimming, basketball, basket, and penny show. Every Saturday you could watch a movie for a penny, and there were like 500 kids there. And uh, then across the street here on 18th and Halstead, there was a theater called Palace Theater. And I used to go to, every Saturday I was going to a show, and most of the movies in those years were cowboy movies or romance movies. So I got really, I, I kind of almost patterned myself after a cowboy. And, and how to challenge and take on. And it's, you know, you don't realize the impact movies have on your life because 
When I decided to come back in the area and take on transforming this neighborhood, when I saw what happened, and I knew I had to be here because of my folks being so ill, uh, it was a cowboy persona that had me be a certain way. Because one of the things I, I was able to, first of all, this area back in 1958, the highway took and took all the people out of here. So all these stores down Halstead became vacant. And it became a big nuisance because a lot of abandoned vacant stores. And uh, it was like scary to see all these uh, place closing down. Anyway, when, when I decided to take on a neighborhood, all of a sudden, like a lot of buildings were for sale. You know, people were coming for me to buy. And I was like an eight year old. I didn't know what the heck to do with them other than I would buy them because all on paper. And uh, what year is this that you're talking about right now? I'm talking about 58. 1950 at the starting of that. The biggest part came in the 60s, like in the 64, 5. But you know, the thing is, this idea of a vision, you know, the, the vision like was formed, like I wanted to make a difference in the area in terms of the quality of life and people and community. And I, I was, didn't quite have it handled at the beginning. But it's interesting, how, if you keep focused and keep working, how it shows up and how people come and support it. One of the, I first at this, I first bought this group of buildings and I decided to close the alley off and make a court out of it. I was making a, a Spanish type court, and I worked with a like people that had money, people that didn't, and artists. And uh, not that artists don't have money, also, but not like that. Anyway. Uh, I decided that wouldn't work because we were nine months and we're still in the same place. So then somebody said they're, they're relocating artists from the uh, Hyde Park Art Center there in the East, East Hyde Park. So we, a couple of the people showed up and they liked the space and I was happy to rent it to them because they were all like storefronts. And I was renting to artists when really like a skunk in the living room. At that time, artists could go to a vacant store and try to rent it and the guy wouldn't rent it because he didn't have any idea one person could live in a storefront. There was a big period there, art, artists weren't like the man. Right today, everybody wants an artist to flavor up the co complex. But in those years, it wasn't like that. So I start, uh, I, I rented a couple artists and I saw how great they were, like they weren't a lot of demands. They just made the space look twice as good and they were easy to be with. So I said, wow. So I all of a sudden I had this, one puzzle handle on who I'm going to rent to and who I'm going to have tenants. So I start working on that and I, as space came, other artists showed up and I start being more creative on like how to make the space entertaining, interesting, how to make the space like open, free, how to get views, where to find them. Anyway, I was doing all that, but it came out of my association with the artists and what turned them on. So I start doing buildings after building you know, just designed around the art world. And I, I got to see, uh, you know, how valuable that training is because, you know, where I'm at right today, you know, I say that, you know, your environment, people's like a, it's in the background, people don't talk about it, but the background shapes your life. You come into it and don't even know about it, but it gives you a certain way of being. So I learned that after you create certain interesting spaces, it turns people on. And one of the things that later I discovered where I was heading is to have Pilsen become a very creative community, one that would totally move, touch, and inspire the whole city. Instead of a place of being needy, it would become an area where actually people would make a difference. And believe it or not, it's just like a miracle. Between whatever I was doing in design, those people showed up. And I've got like some of the most dedicated, committed people and accomplished in this complex, these different complexes, there isn't a city. And it's amazing how, like, in the background, if you keep thinking about it and renting that way, you know, this thing I, that I'm about is not just building, it's the management, it's the people that live there, it's the environment. What are they dedicated and committed to? What am I dedicating to? No, you said it's the people and what they are dedicated and committed to as individuals. And well, I, I think basically uh, from there, the people that come here, 
experience the environment. It gives them freedom. It gives them a light, uh, like, you know, I've had artists come here that people that don't have any art in their life. All of a sudden, like three, four years later, they're like great artists without any professional training. I can take you to one place right now. The guy does awesome work, but he got it like association, just osmosis, being around the art world. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, you know, first of all, you know, artists by and large love to like be around each other and also to be networking and actually be associated. You know, we have some of these activities like we have an annual art fair and then we have like every so often, we have about six or eight busloads of people coming throughout the summer. Uh, we have certain other events and, you know, trying to nurture the art community. And I, for a couple of years ago, I was trying to get a bookstore here to have like ongoing lectures discussion for like an extended community center, but I just couldn't pull it off. It was just a little too much money for the people. But uh, anyway, the uh, the thing is, the artist really kind of helped me fulfill my dreams in the sense that I wanted to literally transform this neighborhood into something that really made a difference for Chicago instead of one that needed entry or port of entry. So that's I, I can say that's an accomplishment because right now it's that. We are a contribution. And it wasn't like me, it was all these people. And they are the ones, you know, that together we developed this. Mm -hmm. Now, you began to tell me about how, I'm not sure, was that in the 60s when you began to make this movement happen and there was some resistance where people were lashing out at you? And Well, actually, you know, this is one of the things, you know, when it's uh, very hard for me to explain who I am and what I'm about because it's not just doing buildings. And it's not about making money. I mean, money's great. But money will show up if you have a passion and you're you got a calling. Money will come, will follow. It's not that. I've always thought that great projects great bring money. And what a lot of people don't do, they don't refine their project to be powerful. As a result, nothing happens around them. But anyway. So what's it about? Well, the, the point is. Uh, it's not about money. It is about what? No, actually, for me, it was about causing community, causing family, causing closeness causing connection, talking, having people feel like they're somebody. You know, I do some of these floor-to-ceiling windows and some of the long views, it's designed. When they stand up there, they are like somebody. I remember when I was in Europe, uh, in Australia, you know, this big promenade. When you stand there, wow, it just moves you. You know, you just feel that power of that space and that environment. Well, that's what I... I'm looking for in, to, in space and living conditions and quarters, things that actually have people experience themselves in a more powerful way. And you know, one of the reasons for these gardens, these gardens are designed to actually, people come here and settle down and, and be more peaceful and be like themselves. You know, that's one of the, and the beauty, you know, when you start bringing beauty in people's lives, it shifts them, you know, they're not, on it about whatever they're on it. There's other dimensions they see, other values they experience. Tell me about some of the opposition to what you've been doing. Well, actually, the opposition, a lot of it is actually, it's from misunderstanding and lack of communication. Because what, what I was up to wasn't developing real estate. I, I hate the word developer. You know, I'm not a developer. I, I cause things to happen, but it's not about money. It's about community. And I will admit, you develop great projects, money will follow. And without money, you can't do much. Although I, over time I've learned during the Depression how to manage that. You know, how to manage and how to work old and new and how to, you know, even ongoingly. One of the things I did over the years, I've always had projects going around people just to give them a sense of security. They heard hammers, they saw construction. Even though the area was very rough, when people heard noise, hammers, they had a different feeling. So I had a big strategy over time, always have some work going on if I went out that way, just to keep people feeling more comfortable. Uh, what were the words? The opposition? Oh, the opposition. About miscommunication and people not understanding? What was it that they perceived to be? Well, the point is, I, I had, unfortunately, there was one group uh, that came here when I was trying to preserve a uh, Schoenhofer brewery. It was like the last historical complex in the city where they had breweries, like some 25 buildings. And there were like 11 of those. And unfortunately, 
It was a too early. It was a great idea. It would have been a, like right now, 30 years later, it would have been very powerful for the end, like a gateway to Pilsen. And if we were trying to put in 250 rental units and a bunch of commercial, and I had a group that was going to it cost 33 million, 11 million at a time. Unfortunately, we just had, we were in opposition to a group that came in here creating jobs. It was a group, Lou Kreinberg, and they came in here like job training and Latino power. And uh, I'm sure their motives were honorable. I'm not saying that. But, you know, they were actually killing the golden goose when they started attacking me because if they would have just backed off and kind of got me like in my entirety and not what they made up about me, they could have benefited immensely because they had all kinds of job training, work programs. And the stuff I did is very extraordinary because it's from coming from creation. It's not like structures of knowing. You know, I've had problems when I hired regular carpenters that are trained and I do this like mix old and new and I make crooked things and straight things and I'm looking for particular values they just can't get it, and it's like always that they think I don't know what I'm doing, like a lot of nonsense, and it kind of gets my sail out of my wind. So I, I've learned to work with unskilled people, not don't have any agendas about what, what they're doing, other than if they want to be somebody and if they're looking to make a difference for themselves. That's the kind of people I have. And those are the people I give the stuff away, and they come out making it much better than I ever imagined. So like with that group, you know, there's a, unfortunately, every time we saw each other, like the top of the hair got up and they're out like miles. <laughs> and I was just myself. You know, I had, one of the things I want to say, like openly and publicly, when you start making changes in anything, and especially the, this area was the bottom of the heap. It was like everything was about ready to fall down. And there was like Wild West on Halls at five taverns, pool hall, shooting every taverns were every weekend somebody was shot in that valley, in the back alley here. When you've got that kind of environment, you know, just tampering with it, just well, I'm telling you, you don't have you never met such difficult people when you start closing taverns down. I was just an individual, I was in a corporation. So I had to take a lot of heat. I had to take a heat, I was probably investigated by every agency in the city. It's so easy to investigate anybody, just report them. And uh, it's absolutely uh, amazing how I survived all that. You know, like I'm just an individual trying to make a difference. And the thing is, the biggest thing missing in all of it was lack of communication, lack of understanding. So when you say lack of communication, what was it that they were misperceiving and what is it that they thought? Well, I wasn't doing? what they thought. Well, what was it that they thought? They thought that. You know, they, I was white and I was going to run the Mexicans out. Well, that's absolutely absurd. You know, my whole lifetime, I probably replaced three Mexican families. Most of the buildings, the Mexicans stayed there. Whoever lived there stayed there until I needed to rehab it. I never, that was never my intention. My intention never was to make this like Yuppieville. You know, I'm not in that to have yuppies here. I was just looking for working artists committed to something and help me cause and make a difference in the area of community. I, basically, I was always looking to cause community. Unfortunately, I was just so hung up and I was just like a human being with my, all the problems we all have. You know, somebody attacks you, you don't like back off and be relaxed. You know, you're in the fighting mode yourself and whatever could happen doesn't happen because you're on it yourself, you know. And, you know, they were doing some nasty things to me. They were funded by the government. They had about 30 people on their staff. They were doing some nasty things about my mother and father picking garbage out of cans, you know, and about me walking around in a suit and going in an alley and picking up a, somebody threw out a, uh, a sink and I would pick it up and take it back to the project. I mean, it, they, were, they were marching on me. You know, the thing is, if they realized See, this was an area beyond what, what the normal people, the knowing people say it can be rehabbed. It wasn't like possible in their world, anybody's world, that this area could come back on its own without federal money, 
somebody just committed and working day after day, you know, 30, 40 years, day, six days a week, bang, bang, and taking all the hits and still going. They, you know, they didn't get that. Unfortunately, it was never kind of an opportunity for us to kind of lay back, sit back and talk this out. You know, like, when you start thinking about changing neighborhoods, oh, it's such a loaded, people have so many things going. It's like, you know, like uh, stereotyping, you know, you know, I, I admit I'm not, I, I'm, I wasn't about to take large families and poor people. Although I worked with artists which were reasonably poor. But I was looking how I could do this in a realistic way as an individual, having to bear all the brunt of the law and still survive. So when the artists show up, I saw that as a gift. And I pursued that because we both transformed in the process. I became more creative. You know, there's not a building I've done here that wasn't one out of creation, like ongoingly creating, looking for views, looking for values. And also, I've gone through a lot of stages, you know, like a stage I was just didn't have much money, so I did enough to get it rented. Another stage, there was like more money around, I could do more, you know, more, you know, more uh, weather stripping, more weatherizing, better windows. And I, you know, over years, I, I've programmed that. It just worked out. I mean, I'm right now at a great place in terms of maintenance building, but it took a life's effort. And it took a lot of, you know, I'm, like I say, there's so much resistance to, to people, to things. You know, it's amazing. Everybody has perceptions, you know. And then once it gets in the world, it's hard to get out of the community. People still think I'm running Mexicans out. They're terribly, and I've never, I, I, I appreciate and I love the Spanish community. They're hard work and they're like myself. You know, they come from a same cultural, God-fearing church. I have no problem with Spanish. You know, and I have maybe 20% of my tenants are Spanish. And they've lived, I don't cream people. I pay, they pay reasonable rent. I don't raise their rent every year. As long as the city doesn't beat me up with taxes, you know, I don't bother people. I also, you know, when one of the things that turns me on, when I go to a apartment and I see how people live, I tell you, I'm so moved by how they decorate, how much they are that apartment. You know, how much they're at home. I mean, how much they love that apartment. I just, it gets me. And if I, you know, if I could afford it, they could live there for nothing. Again, like when I first got started, people were knocking the hell out of everything. Like that was a huge transformation and have people come and live in a place and that's their home. That's not just a place to hang out. It's shown by a lot of self-expression. You see, every apartment, I never like to show apartments without the person there because each apartment looks different with each person. They have their own character, their own complexion. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. It could be very little furniture. It could be a lot. People have all these gifts. And when people, you know, one of the things I say about where there's been a big shift is the people that live here have a lot of self-expression and they express themselves fully, you know, sometimes too fully because I end up paying a lot of money with that creating, <laughs> having to come back when they move. But the point is... Uh, that one of the results that we're having is people actually, it, even though they physically don't own it, they live like they own it. And that, you know, that's part of the environment, that's part of the space. It doesn't just happen, you know, we're in a, we're surrounded here by not the most, we're not, have a Lincoln Park, the lake, all these beautiful amenities. You know, we have a lot of bad buildings around us, bad area. And it's, you know, it, the reputation exactly doesn't change overnight. But I'm awed by people that come and live here. Why were you, or are you still, or why were you originally, and are you still reluctant to rent to families? No, I don't have. No, I'll tell you. I don't have, see, I'm not a builder. You know, if, if somebody, and uh, I have to survive the marketplace economically. And, you know, large families, you know, I, let me just start at the beginning when I was first started. I had buildings that were had a lot of Spanish in there. I rent cheap rent, $85 a month to, to a family of four. Like two weeks later, there were another family with three. 
Like two months later, there are 15 people in there. I couldn't contain that because people would never think 15 people, they would look at me, what are you doing to those people? But the guys that were I renting to were subleasing and subrenting. I mean, how, and then the city come after you because you got all these people. How could you survive that? You know, I, see, you know, handling low-income people, you know, it's, I could, I worked for Urban Real for many years. I studied this. There are solutions. What is Urban Real? Urban Real, I was working with the government. One of the first things I got when I decided to go ahead with this project, I decided I need more training. So I took a job with, with the city of Chicago, Ur Department of Urban Renewal. I was one of the first guys hired. What year? Well, that was about a 1960. So I start working, and uh, I worked in Hyde Park for about five years, and I worked the near west side, I worked Lincoln Park. And they had a program where the city had a different approach. They were like, they had a big vision of the city and renewing areas. See, we don't have that now in Chicago. There's no vision. I mean, I, not that I know of. There's no large vision for the city. It's everybody's market forces. They're on their own. That's what, one of the problems. What, outside of this community, what's your vision for the city? Excuse me? What is your vision for the city outside of this community or including this well, community? Well, you know, I particularly right now, today, I can see like a tremendous opportunity that's, that's almost a window of opportunity is missing in the uh, west side. I think we have a beautiful... Uh, park system, boulevard system, that's been totally under imp under rated, under said, that that feeds into a lot of beautiful parks, and I think one project, like uh, you know, like have abundance. Well, Northside's got abundance in the downtown, but bring abundance to the rest of the city. You know, we have two: the have-nots and the haves. You know, or the haves over there and the have-nots here. You know, these people in this area can't do what they're doing in Lincoln Park, Wicker Park, all that area, because there's not the resources. The banks, you know, it's not so much the people here, but it's what others think. The banks and the institutions and the city, they make up these thoughts that have an area move or not. Because, you know, if you want to get, in Lincoln Park, you can go there and get what they say, time, maybe 12, 15 times the gross, the gross is 1,000, 12,000 a year, you might get 150,000 for rehab or new construction, where in this area, you'd get five times, like maybe two-thirds the rent or half the rent. So you could never have the resources here. That's a reality. That's an economic, social reality. And anyway, uh, wait, I was uh, getting back to family. You know, families, by and large, low-income families are difficult to, you know, they're difficult. They're, the maintenance, the expense, look at what's happened to public housing, no matter how hard they tried, how durable the buildings were. You know, they, they all went to hell. But there was like a bigger management issue. They're like PR. They're like, people weren't about to take that stuff on. You know, like, just take the West Side. I worked on a project. I, I, was, I met some black ministers. They came here and they were inspired by what they saw. So I went out there and worked in what is uh, one of his projects. I worked on a, uh, a food pan uh, where they fed people in a, a battered woman shelter. And we got the thing transformed. And we try to train people, you know, get them off the street. And people that haven't worked ever in their life, people that were just drifters. You know, we worked, we, every, uh, like Tuesday, we had like two hours of training just to try to develop a work crew. And we had worked with uh, maybe three, four months. That would be like about four, about 16, three, uh, 16 events. And each event, we maybe got out of 20 people two or three that might think about working. And then they, one of the requirements that they came back for three times and then we'd get them a job. And, you know, out of all that effort, we, we maybe got four or five people. We worked almost like three months trying to get people in on jobs, buddy system and that, and we just couldn't produce it. I'm saying there's such a, and that was one of my earlier visions was about taking those abandoned buildings and developing entrepreneurship in that area and then training people to work on their own neighborhood, just like I've done here. And it, you know, it wasn't much, I didn't get much support. I got one group to support me, but in large, there wasn't much support for that. What do you think about the market-driven gentrification that's taking place in other neighborhoods around the city? Well, I, I particular, I'll tell you, it's part of a bigger plan. You know, like if, 
I, let's just say if and like we'll play this thing out. It, it's not like the truth. It's it's somebody's opinion. If we took uh, take uh, Douglas Lawndale, I went to school Herzl Junior College, and I admired all those beautiful buildings and beautiful environments. If they took uh, Douglas Boulevard and that whole area and declared an urban renewal area like they back in the 60s, a square mile, and they said we're going to make we're going to have this area now a renewed community. We're going to have it a community that will travel through the park system and through the expressway. They don't have to go through any parts of Chicago. All they'll ever see is beauty, beauty of the, of the parkway, beauty of the gardens. And then when they get their own community, the beauty of that community. Because there's so much land available and, and right now it's, there's no use for it. There's no future because, you know, uh, it's one of those parts of Chicago that doesn't have it. And it's going to, you know, in this lifetime right now, We've got such a demand for city living, and what they're doing on the north side, they're really, in my opinion, they're killing that with traffic, they're overbuilding, they're taking good facade blocks that look beautiful, all of a sudden they have a couple of four stories, and then it looks like the rest should be torn down. You know, there is it's chaos, and they have buildings they are living like 10 feet apart, people spending three, 400,000. They could go there and people have estates and they could get a lot of that pressure off of the north side, bring it over to the west side, and, and carry it on throughout the south side. You know, that's like having a vision. That's like uh, creating that. And it would take work. You know, it would take the government, it would take individuals, it would take a lot of talking, get the black community accepted. You know, that in itself, there aren't enough blacks to fulfill any because most of them are leaving the west side. So it doesn't belong actually to anybody. Right now is an opportunity that we could rebirth that area. I mean, that's like, if you did that, you would take a lot of pressure of, tr of trying to take good neighborhoods and get more people in. You know, like you take Ravenswood, you know, or Lakeview. I mean, they're wonderful areas. But if you start overbuilding and you can't get through intersections, you can't get it, you know, all these people can't park your car. It's just, I don't know if you've ever dri driven there lately, it's just, it's a tough deal. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is like wishful thinking, but I had experienced this over in the, in working through urban renewal, emotionally, physically, and this project is like that. This project would have never, it, it, what I'm saying to you about the, about the west side is possible because I've experienced it here in Pilsen as an individual, and I saw what happened over time. So let me ask you, one of the things that I hear when people talk about gentrification and changing neighborhoods is they say, we want development, but we want development without displacement. In other words, people want to be able to build up their communities, but they want to build them up with the people who live there now and make them better for the people who live there, not at the expense of the people who live there and the people who bring the new money in and who buy the new homes being the catalyst for the change. How do you create that in the neighborhoods that you're well, talking about? Well, you know, for myself, this, there's nobody living here. These were abandoned buildings. And like I said, I had to work with tools and materials that would be doable for me as an individual. And the artists became that blessing for me because the artists were easy to be with. They weren't chronic complainers. They, uh, it didn't have to be perfect. You know, they went there and made it better. And I could tolerate that. I could have more buildings because I wasn't loaded down with a lot of complaints and a lot of problems. Now. You know, low to rent to, in Pilsen, you know, I've got buildings that I could say are low rent, they're as low as there is. It's a high maintenance, high repair, high water bills. And I'm just talking right now as a property owner, not like a social worker or someone else. You know, in, in the area, incidentally, you know, all these people complaining about me gentrifying. Every time a Spanish building was sold in this immediate area, Everybody in that building got kicked out and they brought their own family in. I mean, so there's a lot of displacement here over time. But it was naturally, you know, people brought their own family, wanted their own, be with their own people. So, you know, I want to just back off. You know, I've never been about, I've never displaced people, first of all. I've never thought those were bad people or outsiders. You know, one of the things I've been looking at myself, I was trying to create a foundation for the arts and architecture in which one of the things, uh, looking at sustainable communities with the focus on quality of life issues. And one of the things missing 
around me is people have no, uh, they don't have any thoughts about their environment. You know, they could live next to junk cars, next to smells, next to heavy traffic, and not look at this as a residential community and be a demand for that. See, if, if I can do all this here, if people around me don't also follow suit, I'm screwed. You know, if this can't grow, it'll go back. You know, it's important for me that good part of Pilsen upgrades, improves, and their standard of life improves. And I, you know, I'm limited. I'm just a guy with a project. You know, there's a lot of opportunity out there to create better the quality of people's lives in the better community, more residential. You know, it's been such a, you know, such a laid back community, and it's been forgotten. You know, for this is a fact. For 30 years, property values have not changed one dollar. It was recently when the city came and put a bunch of uh, resurrection houses that they sold where the properties doubled and tripled, everybody. Buildings were selling for 15000 two-story, three-story, three flats. When they put the $100,000 resurrection, they became thirty-five, and then not too long they became sixty. Right today, there's hardly a building here, no matter how bad, that is not worth at least a hundred thousand. I'm just saying that uh, for whatever it is. But basically, uh, you know, for me, this like growth is like burdens because the taxes have gone crazy. Maybe four times since then, water bills, everything else has gone up. Tell me a little bit about Jewtown and Maxwell Street and how it's, the changes that are taking place there are affecting this immediately adjacent community here. Well, you know, I, I was a very participant in Maxwell Street. We were buying all our clothes, and I, I enjoyed going there. Like in the 20s and 30s, we used to go buy clothes. and I used to buy pants, for example, and I didn't realize when I got them home, one pant leg was shorter than the other. <laughs> anyway, my mother used to like to haggle with people there. Uh, I think over time it's been a huge resource, you know, like the Sunday afternoon, Sunday, you know, community. And it starts to really start deteriorating, like in the later years, in terms of goods they were selling and participation. But I think historically that had, you know, I'm sorry to see that they're not putting more play into it. It was a very significant uh, contribution to this area because. It fed, you know, just you, up at three, four blocks around there, it was like people fed into that, in that market, because the immigrants went there because of the low cost. And uh, also, you know, you go there and you f find all these products you've never seen before, people selling stuff. It was quite an education. And I'm personally sorry because it was like a, one of the places that you're known for, you know, it's over the years. And, you know, those hot dogs and hamburgers, God, I mean, when you smell them, you can't stop eating them. <laughs> but basically, uh, I'm surprised that the university hasn't been more for, more giving and allowed more of it to take place. Some of the shopping and some of the traits and habits and uh, the marketplace. I mean, it's good days. You know, it, it wasn't always... When I was a kid, it was like the good days. It got later in life, it became not that. You know, it became mostly a lot of hot goods and people want to get rid of stuff. And I mean, it was a good market for exchange, but... And then it was like the maintenance of it. You know, people, buildings just going to pieces. As UIC builds up that area for their own needs and their own uses, yeah. how will that impact this community? Well. I've got some mixed feelings because uh, it's going to create some serious problems here because for me, uh, I don't want to say about myself because I have my story about that, but as far as the Latin community, it's going to kind of be interesting as how the city goes after them in terms of meeting the building code and environment. And it's also going to be interesting because, you know, we're across the tracks, and this is a part of the city that's on the other side, economic, socially. And it's kind of going to be interesting how the financial world and other communities that support development and construction played out here. And the, it's the biggest thing for me is the political aspect. You know, given the Spanish are going to be half of the population, 
what's going to be happening, uh, you know, whether the city will put the screws to these owners and have be a point where they sell. It's going to be interesting. I just say it's interesting. <laughs> I don't want to make any comments on that. But... Uh, Do you see some threat to what you've created here over decades? No, I don't think I'm a threat at all to them. What about them being a threat to you? No, not at all. I Listen, you know, in my project here, all the projects, there's very, very little crime. There's absolutely hardly any crime. We This past year, I don't think we've had a break-in. I don't think we had a person that was outside of graffiti, but there was no violence, there's nothing. You know, I think the Latin community and art community, I'm talking about the people now, not some activists that are up there talking, but the people generally. You know, I've had a lot of young Mexicans that became carpenters because of being inspired some of the work I've done. I could give you 10 right off the top of my head, young kids that were inspired. And I've had a lot of policemen I had neighbors come and they want to build that, what they saw I did. They're asking me for advice, you know. And I've been all, you know, I've never been the kind of a person that really tries to rub people in anything. I just kind of go with the flow. But I've had a lot of, uh, I, I'm, I know I have impacted a lot of people's lives by passing through the project and seeing some of the structures and some of the lighting and some of the gardens. It made a huge difference in their lives, and they've taken it on for themselves. You know, and I've had, you know, over the years, I've had a lot of Spanish people. I have a lot of the politicians living in my project. You know, my project is socially, culturally, economically diverse. You know, and, uh, and I will say, you know, I have, like, most of these people living here could live anywhere in a city. You know, they're not living here because of low rent. They're not living here because of... They're living here because of the community and environment and the people that are here. You keep referring to your project. Explain to me what is the project. Well, the project, by and large, is this area east of probably Peoria or east of Sangamon, going all the way to Canal from 16th to 21st. And it's a... It's just the blocks and groups of buildings in which a lot of artists live. And they've kind of established a lifestyle of, you know, in the, in the, the setting, you know, it's not, it's not literally transformed. We don't, the city has never invested much money here. We still got the same recycling, the same stuff if you drive around that was here five years ago. I'm, I'm sure that as, uh, as a university, as we get closer where they're, finished building, there'll be a lot more pressure to get the recycling out, to get the factories out, and get some of the adverse nuisances out. I'm sure there'll be a tendency to have this be more residential and not a mixed community. And I, that's where my foundation for the arts and architecture was to actually start educating people on the environment and how it impacts their quality of life. So they can be a demand to have these things taken care of from, from the city. Because by itself, I don't think the city will do it. It's got to be the community that stands up and demands that and participates for that. You know, one of the big pluses, like since we started the project, you know, they put a new saving and loan, like a three, four million dollar just down the block. A new school. You know, it's one of the finest schools in Chicago. They've got a great principal. And they got great facilities. It's up to sixth grade. I went to that school as a kid. And, uh, you know, those are, I'm sure they're the results of what was happening in the art colony. Because that had been all just leveled and been junky buildings. Those people wouldn't have come here. It might have been, maybe it had been a clearance area. It might have been an area like around Maxwell or West. You know, had I not intervened. And I was really uh, turned down by taking run-down buildings and transforming them. It kind of gave me a, a sense of accomplishment. And usually the worst part of the building became the best. I'm a strong believer that there's nothing that you can't make beautiful or that you can't make better in the physical world. I'm not talking about human beings. <laughs> but you can take, if somebody says this hard, apartment's hard to rent, I all of a sudden find ideas that it's the hottest one we've got. Just 
you know, that's one thing great about property and buildings. You can really, a lot of my stuff is conversation and like creating that instructional conversation. And those right results show up. How many properties do you own in this area? Well, let me just say I got a lot of them. <laughs> I have a lot of them. You know, I, I've been here a lifetime. You know, one of the things that upsets me is I have a lot of buildings on Halston. And people say, oh, that jerk. Why does he own these buildings? Give them away. You know, where were they when the battle was on for the street? When I was taking on the gangs and the taverns and all the stuff that took place and all the threats on my life. And I stood my ground. Where were they then? <laughs> After it's kind of looking good, everybody wants it. Just like people want to buy my buildings, but they want to, me, they want to pay me what I paid for them. Nothing about the work. It took like 30, 40 years of six days a week. It wasn't just given to me. I earned it, really, I earned it. <laughs> and I don't talk like egotistically about that, because I just love what I do and I love, I love everything about it. I love my tenants, I love the environment, I, you know. We have our art fairs. Every so often I get tired of kind of having the artists talk about their work and pushing. And a couple of years ago I went there like a tourist myself. And I'm looking at these spaces and oh, I'm totally awed by what I saw. And I never realized that was me. You know, I was doing that. But coming from another place, I was awed by what I saw. And I really, I really got to. Like one time in life, appreciate myself as a human being and the accomplishment. Remember, it came from poverty. I really struggled through poverty. The very people about the poor people. You know, one of the things when I was a kid, we had this milk business. And the only difference between me and the neighborhood kids was I was always clean and had clothes. But I got so much heat being called a greenhorn. You know, my father had this milk business, and we didn't have any more than anybody else, but we worked like crazy. Worked, 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 worked. And I looked clean, and people were envious. I had to, you know, talk about issues around money. I have them because, you know, I, you know, I, like I said, I, this project was never about making money and living like a king in a suburb and having a castle. You know, I'm still wearing the same clothes. I'm still living like the same lifestyle, the same quality of life. Only thing, I'm, I'm living my dream. <laughs> I'm sorry. To... I'm sorry. You don't need to be. It's not that I'm sad, it's just I'm so moved. It's like touching the, touching the soul, massaging the soul when I talk like that. I've always felt that I was inadequate to the job. Like I couldn't, you know, I didn't know enough, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't good enough. And somehow I survived it all. And I still have that thing that I'm not good, I don't know enough, I'm not good enough. You know, it's just, uh, and I, one thing, like I said earlier, I'm so glad I'm up, up in years and I can look back and experience the different periods of time, the changes, and have that wisdom. It's such a gift to age. I just want to, anybody who's listening is up in years, it is a gift you know, to have that wisdom and maturity and and be able to look back on your life and see where you, what you did with your life. I don't know that getting our story out of it. <laughs> but listen, I don't I get kinda of off the different beats here. It's all right. Is there somewhere I could get back on the track that you wanted to you know, Some, getting Yeah, I mean what what ideas do you have about the larger city in general at this point in history? The, the, what? the city as a place, Chicago, in the year 2000. What are your ideas about where this community of a couple million well, people is at? Well, I personally, you know, would like to see 
you know, that Pilsen become a the thriving art community, and it got recognized for that. Which building? Well, the, all these areas, this whole area, not just a building, the community. And inside of that, you know, we have some of the abundance, some of the joy of having beautiful things and beautiful streets and alleys and properties. And I'm not against that. See, I spent my whole life working on rundown buildings and transforming them. And you see what result out of that. You know, I'm totally committed to not knocking buildings down. But I see a time coming now where, like, the times have changed, you know, and I can see where, like, sections will eventually be torn down, you know, after my lifetime, where people be doing more. Nothing stands still, socially, economically. But I hope that it become, you know, wherever it's at, that it becomes this community that's a community that's a resource for all of Chicago and that, that's honored and respected, where, where it was one of very needy. I grew up in a very needy, troubled community. And what about beyond this community? Ideas about the way the whole city operates at this point? Well, as far as the city, you know, it's pretty hard. You know, I particularly loved it when there was like ethnic communities. I loved to go in the Mexican community. I loved the Greek town. I loved to go Chinatown. I loved to go where Italians are. I'm a, like a socially, culturally diverse guy. I just love all those. You know, I get a lot of richness. I love traveling. I love seeing different worlds, different cultures. I mean, that's the richness. I hope we don't get lose too much of that. You know, I really think that Chicago right now, you know, probably one of the foremost communities that has all this, still has it. I mean, New York probably has it. I don't know about Detroit or Cleveland or Boston. Boston probably still has a lot of that. But I like to see that that culture of diversity still be here and honored by all people. And I'd like to, you know, I'd like to see the uh, there be a lot, you know, traffic and automobiles be handled. See, I grew up when there was maybe you you. I grew up when I was in my early twenties. You might see twenty cars in a day. Now you see thousands of cars. If you get on highways down the street. You know, I grew up when there's all streetcars around here. You jump on a car, it was very joyful. You hang on the back and people all laughing, charged. You know, that was a great life when the streetcars were here. So I don't know if you're in, in uh, San Francisco riding those trolleys. People are really turned down, aren't they? You know, it gives them a certain life. It, a lot of togetherness and a lot of jo joking around. But I like to see... Uh, some of that get back to Chicago, where people are a little more laid back and not so me, me, money, money driven. And, uh, you know, one thing I admire about the Spanish community, I don't know if you ever, when you get around them, they're such nurturing, loving people. You know, I went to Chinatown the other day. I couldn't get over it. I was watching this mother, Chinese mother, take care of her young one. She gave him so much love, I just couldn't... Uh, I could hardly get it, you know, not get it, but I could, the experience of her love for her child, I just, was very moving for me. But, you know, uh, I see in all these cultures, there's such, like, diversity and that they all have different things. That I hate to see that get lost. But then physically, you know, I'd like to see, like, less traffic somehow. And I'd like to see where Hostel Street becomes more retail, where we have more displays of, uh, like restaurants, art things, or stores. One of the things missing now, with half the highway, half the neighbor torn down with the highway, if the city doesn't do anything and put more people here to feed this commercial, you know, it's not going to take place. We need more people in Pilsen. And I imagine over time, you know, Pilsen's one of the, you know, if you look at the city, north, south, east, it's probably the last area where land values are so cheap. And I'm sure the city went through and offered everybody twice what they wanted. They could then sell it for six times more than they paid. I don't think that's doable simply because of politics. But in that case, you wouldn't have anything like that kind of a community. You'd have what you... I don't know if, you, if you've been over on the Fulton Market and in that east of Halstead, God, the kind of overcrowding and the density. Oh, I can't imagine human beings being human in those environments. <laughs> you know, it's just 
no room, no no stretch, no beauty. What are these photos they have with you? Oh, this photo is a building I'm doing on, on uh, I'm doing a building on Desplaines. Oh, it's a building on Desplaines. It's a single family. It was a two flat when I bought it, and the family wake up had it. They had 11 kids, and I grew up with that family. And about 15 years ago, the, one of the last of the children died, so they, the family sold me the building. And, uh, you know, one of the things I do with buildings, you know, I try to, I'm doing this hopefully to have uh, like an art studio for, for a, uh, some art student from the Art Institute. And it's a two-story, it's got an atrium, it's got a lot of lights, got balconies, it's got a beautiful garden next door to it that a couple neighbors take care of the garden in the back. And, uh, you know, I just love to have, like, indoor-outdoor, where you stand in your place. It's almost like being out there and you're being in, and you're experiencing beauty. And in doing that, you know, you, your life shifts. When you experience beauty, no matter what's up for you, you your kind of life shifts into something else. So, like, that's what I'm trying to put these values in these properties so people get that, that sense of experience that you know, they see more to life than where they're at, you know, internal dialogue stuff. And I'm just about done with that, and I put a big fence across to tying both properties, and also this garden was, this garden, uh, there's a neighbor next door, that he and his wife, she recently died at 96, and he died at, right after her, about a year later, at uh, 92. But th for 25 years, they maintained this formal garden they both worked at it. That was their joy of life. Hmm. And now the children of the, the uh, grandchildren are taking care of that garden. But you know, uh, one of the things, you know, if, you, if everything kind of shakes down, like what I'm about is to actually um, creating powerful environments for that nurture and support the human being, you know, the, the person to help uh, to help his life be like more uh, where he can put up with it and also <laughs> where else he can experience some uh, joy and some happiness and also feel himself as an individual and like he's a very powerful human being. Those kind of values. You know what? What sort of inner dialogue the word you used, are you... Yeah, that's kind of dialogue I get because, like I said, I walk, you know, whenever I'm, like, upset, I walk around my projects that I haven't finished, and I completely flip and get turned on. And, you know, these projects, I've just gotten so much in terms of uh, nurturing, in terms of uh, self-love, in terms of uh, being somebody, in terms of contributing to others. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but and then you know one of the things I I just want to acknowledge, like my workmen, you know, they're extraordinary human beings. In that, you know, they they take these projects on and they're fulfilling what I you know most of the times I'm they're I don't supervise them. They just take it on and that shows up. But they've taken on the vision themselves. And the same thing with a lot of my tenants. It just seems that people take this vision on, whether they know it or not, conscious or unconscious. And I think that's a, that's one of the things I can say, I can forward to future generations, is live your life from this kind of a context. And your life alters. It's just a structural conversation, the structural shape. And I think, uh, unfortunately, architects, you know, one of the Benefits I have, I deal with people, I see what turns them on, what they don't like, what they like, what gives them highs, what doesn't. In the field of architecture, they, get, they learn how to do certain things from knowing, but then they, they seldom get to have the feedback that I have, you know, working with people that closely. And uh, even like working with a block, how do you get a block of buildings together such that community arises? Or how do you manage it, and who do you bring, and how do you... See, it's such an intricate thing. I mean, my, I've been so lucky to have my wife support me, and a lady just recently died, Maureen. She was a 
from University of Illinois School of Art 35, 40 years ago. She came looking for a, a house and then eventually she became one of our rental agents. And she caught the vision on fine. And, you know, um, fortunately she was able to bring people that kind of mix and gel. You know, I have like five different complexes and each one has its own identity and own, you know, like learning how to put people with each other such that better things show up for all of them. That's kind of a gift, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, somehow you got to get that out. One part, you know, it's just not like renting to anything or anybody. It's not like that. It's like everything has to be managed. There's nothing that works without being managed, you know, in terms of, I don't mean like steering or keeping blacks out, keeping rich people out or keeping poor people. I don't mean that at all. But I mean, uh, you know, personalities, you know, what their vision is, what they're about creating. That's why we've been able to create such generative people, you know, people that are up making a difference. It's not that we're advertising that, but those are the people that show up. <laughs> Anything else that you want to share, John? Well, I feel kind of silly, like, like talking my guts out, but... Uh, You know, I've, I've, um, you know, I've worked like 40 years. I had a head injury. I, I thought I was gone. I hit a beam with my head, and I survived that. And I believe my, about four or five people want to kill me, and I've been able to manage that. I was in, you know, like before I was 12, I had four near-death experiences. I had two by fire, one by drowning, one by accident. And it's a miracle. I'm still here at 78. <laughs> Will you tell me your name once more and where we are? <laughs> well, my, my name is John Podmajerski, and uh, you know, I, I'm talking so much about me, 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 but, you know, I have a wonderful wife that for 40 years supported me. Okay, never had learned bookkeeping, and that bookkeeping was her whole life. I have a wonderful son that's taking on, like, following my footsteps only at a higher level. And I've got a daughter that just bought a house in Boulder that she's going to, an old house that's going to, in the Stark District, that she's going to transform. I gave her a bunch of carpenter tools. A couple days.